That should be the intro and the outro. You've got to get that recorded. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> all right. Welcome to the Library Love Fest podcast. I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm Lainey Mays. And I'm Grace Catanolo. We are the library marketing team at HarperCollins Publishers. We bring librarians and great books together. The new year brings new offerings from our podcast. The first episode of the month will have book presentations, author interviews, voicemails from librarians like you, and more. And our mini episode halfway through the month features our Library Reads winners. Don't miss our winning authors' acceptance speeches. Welcome and enjoy the show. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Check it out. Collins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Library Love Fest podcast. It's Lainey. And Virginia. And we are back for our March episode. We have a lot of goodies in store for you today. We do. And maybe even the occasional bark from Lainey's dog, Fig. She just wants to be heard. (laughs) All right. So here we go. we got lots to talk about, and we're going to get right to it. Lainey, that writer's watch was pretty cool, wasn't it? It was so great. And, you know, you just get a group of writers together to watch, and (laughs) and they surprise you with like all the themes that come out and the love for libraries yeah so this was our second um episode of this program that we started called writers to watch and it takes place once a month and it's um from seven to eight at night eastern time and so this past uh episode featured Jacqueline Winspear who wrote the standalone which is so cool so all you Maisie Dobbs fans out there Check it out. And all you people who have been afraid because you think, I don't even know where to start with a series as long as Maisie Dobbs. Start with this book, The White Lady. You'll be so hooked by her brilliant writing. God, everything that she brings to the table. She talked so much about it. It was really cool. We had RF Kuang talk about Yellow Face, which is going to take the world by storm. That book's already being buzzed about everywhere. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Pretty neat indeed. Um... Yeah, that's a great book. If you're if you know if you, if you're in publishing or if you're not in publishing, this book grabs you from that first page, you know, because it's just she and she writes what she knows and it's and you know that she knows because it's just ticking all the boxes, you know, about I don't know about submissions and and rights reversions and all that stuff that you know is sort of inside baseball and it's so cool. But then the bigger story is even cooler and it's kind of creepy and kind of wacky that she tries to this character tries to pull this off but anyway it's a great she's a great writer and so varied um what else rachel cochran the gulf that book that was a special one this woman who has grown up in you know the gulf town in texas uh, after a big storm she's living there with um with her family her brother has just died and Vietnam and the town is really, you know, decimated. There's there's not many people there and they're trying to move out. Her family wants her to move to a different town, but she's really holding on to it. And that's when someone from her past comes and maybe the this woman that she had a relationship maybe with in the past and some old secrets come up when she's there to this woman comes in to help with her mother's estate. And um, yeah, it's it's set in the seventies. It's it's super. It's got a little mystery in there. It's got a little thing for everybody. Yeah, she was really neat to listen to, and so and so it was was. Well, last book that the other the last author certainly not the least Megan Clausen falling hard for the royal guard. Uh, I mean, what could be more compelling than a story written about a woman who lives in the Tower of London? written by a woman who lives in the Tower of London because her father's a beef eater. You can't make it up. No. And if she didn't actually do that, I probably would be like, that's not real. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. But it's true. And she has such really cool bonus material, like that TikTok video she made. And I don't know. It's just, it's stuff you would never think would be inside the walls of that structure. Yeah. And yet it's, it's very funny. So she, uh, what I thought was really cool. So we have these two debuts, Rachel and Megan, and then we have Arv Kwong, who is so, you know, she's written all, she's written, she's made her, she's made her mark. She hit the ground running, Arv Kwong. And now, um, and, and then there's Jacqueline Winspear, who is a seasoned pro. And so what a cool conversation while we were live and when we went off, when we went off the air, just listening to Jacqueline Winspear talk to these authors, these young authors who are starting their careers and the advice that not even advice, just her, just kind of like her, her experiences and her, the things that she learned along the way and what she'd do differently. And it was just, and for them to listen to her so earnestly and so, you know, in awe of her. I just thought it was so cool. You never know what's going to happen when we when we do these these things. And it was just it's just fun to just sit back and listen. I love that. Yeah. That's no better way to intro this than to let everyone listening listen in for themselves. So here's a clip from after the show. You can watch the full show at Crowdcast or our Facebook page at Library Love Fest. I love listening to you, to Jacqueline and Rachel in the very beginning. I thought that was just absolutely stellar. It was just such a crystallized, beautiful conversation to be privy to. When you said, Virginia, you're not saying anything. I'm like, I'm not saying a word because <laughs> this is this is their time. And it was it was wonderful. That was so special for me. And the opportunity to to learn from Jacqueline and from Rebecca's wisdom and to hear from a fellow debut novelist about what this process has been like and how it's going. I mean, what a what a unique event. And um just for me as as a huge fan of the existing bodies of work of the two established writers on the panel, I just felt like I was in Candyland here. I was um head in the clouds. So thank you very much for inviting me and for taking the time. My name is Rachel Cochran and my debut novel, The Gulf, will be coming out in June of 2023. The Gulf is a queer literary thriller with shades of Southern Gothic. It's about um, how an obsessive female friendship during the murkiness of adolescence turns to um, suspicion and turns to the main character, um, digging into things she thought she knew and thought she understood about her childhood and her hometown and seeing them in a new light, understanding all of the, the secrecy and darkness and depth that she had missed. What? Oh, great. I'm very impressed. The White Lady follows the, if you will, the, the, the wartime experiences through two wars of Eleanor White from childhood through to womanhood. And indeed, then she is plunged into yet another war, and that is the war against organized crime in 1947 London. And one of the things that it traces is, is the impact of the war on an individual, particularly someone who has been trained as a killer as a child. One of the quotes that really underpinned my work uh, is it was from a woman called Eglantin Jeb. And she said, every war is a war against the child. She was the founder of the Save the Children Fund. And offline, we were just talking about COVID and its impact on, on us as writers. And whilst I couldn't say that my life changed dramatically in that time because I'm used to working alone and as a, a, a woman of a certain age, I've been through lots of different things in my life. So I had tools to get through that. But one of the things I commented on was the the horrible challenges that faced young people from little children right up to people in their 20s and 30s. And people were talking about, and it was in the newspapers, in the media, the war against COVID. And that was another war that impacted children. And I know from speaking to people in their 80s who went through the Second World War, and I'm thinking of my mother here in particular who suffered greatly during that war, and how that 
she was still suffering that wound when she was literally to the day she died and and wondering how things might have been different. So what I think I would like to bring to the conversation is the compassion that we have to extend towards particularly the young people that endured COVID and that endure any particular war, whatever that war is. And because I feel that later in life, they will have behaviors, they will have memories, it would dictate the rest of their lives. And for that, we have to have compassion. And I think that is such a compassion is one of the greatest gifts that we can give other people from the heart. And as Maurice Gump said, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. It's lovely, yeah. I, I was very much from the heart. I, I, I know. I do, I do feel that. And I, I get a bit choked up. <laughs> I know. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Well. You know, I, I, I think about all those little children in Ukraine. And, uh, uh, and to recount a story, and I think Megan might have read this in the papers, that there was this... Um, there was a, early on in the war, um, a team of doctors headed by um, a leading pediatric oncologist um, working in the United Kingdom. They flew out to Ukraine to bring back the kids that were undergoing chemo and various uh, treatments for cancer. So these kids were getting on the plane and they, you know, off, a lot of them, are, you know, they've got tubes sticking out of them. They've got their little siblings with them. They've got their mother with them. Most of them have said goodbye to their fathers because their fathers were away fighting. And so these kids were on the plane, all having gone through the terror of uh, being invaded and being bombed. And they had two play therapists on the plane. And the doctor in charge, I can't remember his name, said he wasn't sure when they took off because, of course, they've got, you know, staff on, they've got doctors, nurses, you know, whether we could fit to play therapist, but he said, I wish we could have taken more because these therapists just help the kids get out of their heads just to play for that yeah. plane journey that was taking them out of a war zone. And they've already been in a war zone. It's the war zone against, against their own mortality as little yeah. children and they're poor parents and they're going for treatment in, in, in the UK. And, uh, that's the kind of story that breaks your heart. I mean, how much can one person bear? How much can one person bear? And uh, that is, in a way, what drives my storytelling. And, uh, and of course, I like to weave humor in and I weave little st other stories in. And because we have to remember that as, as, uh, as novelists, we are actually in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and some people don't even want to admit that. But, you know, <laughs> people, are, you know, they're in the entertainment business. and. Uh, um, and so, uh, you know, that has to work on a lot of levels. But um, I, I think, uh, to me, compassion is, is one of the most important qualities that a human being can exercise. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're all telling stories and you're all, um, you know, you can only cry so much. And um, there has to be some levity, but there also has to be um, empathy. And, you know, as Lainey always says, she she loves a book as she walks away and she's learned something. Lainey said that from day one. And we learn something from each each of your books, you know. And so you've delivered on so many levels, on all the levels, really. And I can't wait to read these books. And by the way, in my in my dining room, I've got a, a large photograph of the Tower of London surrounded by the ceramic poppies. Oh, um, my yeah. husband got a blow, blow photograph of me for, for, for Christmas and uh, it had it framed. And I've also got one of those poppies that another friend sent to me. It's in my front garden. And do you know about the ceramic poppies that, that surrounded? It was in 2014, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, it was to commemorate the, I think it was to commemorate the armistice. That must have been, I never saw it in person. That must have been absolutely something to see. So they um, they did for, in 2014, they did the poppies. And that was um, just to to commemorate the, I think it was the, the 100 years anniversary of the beginning. That's of right. Of and yeah. then um, in 2018, so I wasn't here for that. And then I was here in 2018 and they they did a similar thing. But instead of poppies, they had um, 
flames that were individually lit every single night to oh, um, mark wow. the end of the war as well so it's um yeah there's been been many a poignant moment that um yeah really touches you and that that's the that's the incredible thing about being here is is it's there's thousands and thousands of years and and like you say thousands of stories from so many different moments in time where it, it just yeah mm. makes you stop and think but I'm looking okay. to forward to the story about the ghost a relationship <laughs> with a ghost you know <laughs> getting um, a, get a rom-com getting a, someone getting advice from a ghost from you know the 1600s <laughs> anyway um, there you go would I just be able to add something just on that on the topic of like compassion and everything like that and um I know it's very, very topical at the moment is is the romance genre and and how it's not been taken very seriously for for a, a number of years and how actually in this time, how how we've seen such a massive increase in romance readers. And I think that really reflects um, everything that Jacqueline was saying about compassion and it, there's always something that I think about and and I know this is quite deep but I often think about well what's what's the point of being here why are we here what are we doing if we've got war and we've got all of these awful things going on in the world and and I just my mind always comes back to love and whether that's Absolutely. romantic love yeah or friendship or family and and I think we we can't underestimate the power of love and um and the power of romantic fiction in that sense that if there is one thing that makes us human, it's our ability to love and be loved. And, and I think I'm, I'm so excited to see this new kind of drive for a respect for romantic fiction, because it, it's, it's not a new thing. Like you, you only have to look at Austin and, and the Brontes and everything like that. They knew the value of love and Wuthering Heights is one of my my all-time favorite books and me too and, the and I, yeah. yeah the yeah, way yeah. That, that Emily Bronte writes about love and how it's it's both grief and it's something that's that's raw and visceral but also something that's that's beautiful and and I think that the I I'm so honored as a writer that I can convey love in my in my writing and I think yeah, definitely. The the respecting the the romantic fiction is is definitely a, a thing I I'm constantly rallying behind because I I think in this time where where we're searching for a meaning post COVID, well not not quite post COVID, but post lockdown and everything like that, I think love is is exactly what we need and exactly what the the world is is yearning. What the world for. needs now, yeah. And it, and I have to tell you, for me, it, it's so inspiring, you know, to to. To, to hear you know Megan and Rebecca and Rachel talk about their books you know and I I I I, I it's left me with a feeling gosh I wish I'd have had the courage to write when I, I was your age because wow. I'm you know I, I wish I'd had that courage because I I didn't I didn't and uh and uh it, it you know it's um it, it it took some very big moves for me to 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 do that and um I'm, I'm I just I'm in awe of what you've done and I I more power to you I think it's terrific I I just can't wait to read what you I can't wait, wait to read your books <laughs> be lovely oh fabulous well next we have a real treat for you because our own Grace Kananola who can't be here when we're recording this previously talked to author Jade Song about her book Chlorine and I know Grace is such a big fan of this book and it really shows in the interview and I think they had a lot of fun and I have to say you're gonna want to pick it up after this if you haven't already so let's hear from Grace as she interviews Jade Song. Hi everyone my name is Grace Catanolo and I'm the library marketing assistant at HarperCollins and I'm here today with Jade Song author of Chlorine Jade is a writer, art director, and artist. Their debut novel, Chlorine, is about a swimmer term mermaid, which publishers weekly called Visionary and Disturbing. It is on sale March 28th, 2023 from William Morrow. She grew up going to Pittsburgh libraries and now frequents her neighborhood library in Brooklyn. She loves her friends, paintings, and long walks. Jade, thank you for being here to chat about Chlorine and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here and chat to librarians because I love libraries. 
Well, you're in great company. They love hearing from authors, and I'm just so glad that you get to be here. You had some really beautiful reviews come in, and I definitely wanted to, I did want to read one of them. You got a star review on the book list, which is amazing, and it reads, Song's debut is a strikingly original coming-of-age story, full of contradictions, magnificently balancing and remarkably sustaining wonder with dread and magical realism with harsh reality. With a heartbreakingly beautiful and intense, intensely uneasy tone, this is a story that will hold readers in its thrall. Right for discussion, Chlorine is a great choice for fans of weird, immersive, female-driven body horror by authors like Julia Armfield, Cassandra Ka, and... Carmen Marie Machado and that was a hard review and I think that was just such a beautiful review and it's so true I have not shut up about it since I read it back in October and I went through and did a little refresh um, to prepare for this and I was like okay this holds up I love this just as much as the first time around um, so do we do you want to go ahead and tell the librarians a bit about your book um, sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for your kind words, first of all. Um, but Chlorine is basically just about a girl who is a very talented competitive swimmer, um, and she dreams of becoming someone and something bigger than herself, which is a mermaid. Um, and the novel touches on a lot of themes from growing up uh, to body horror to just the horror of having a body in general um, and being alive. Uh, but I think there is a lot of tenderness in the novel. I think there's a lot of love, uh, self-love and love for the people around you. Um, so I hope that you know, librarians and readers both really enjoy the book. Thanks for chatting about the book a little bit, and I know you want to read a short passage. Okay, awesome. Uh, because this is a library love fest, I just wanted to read a short section from my novel that takes place in a library. Um, for context, the two main characters, Ren and Kathy, are in a fight, and Ren is hiding out in her favorite place, the library, and Kathy comes to find her. Um, so this is just a very short part of it. I started avoiding Kathy. I hated her pity, and I hated her tattling. During the lunch period, instead of sitting in the cafeteria with her, I huddled in the library with the stacks of books I used to love. Friends I had given up in favor of the pool. After four days of avoiding Kathy during lunch, she came to the library to find me. Hey, she walked directly to my desk. When I caught sight of her entering the library, I immediately gazed down at my textbook, pretending I hadn't seen her, freezing in case any flinch on my part would quicken her pace toward me. I cursed myself for taking off my sunglasses so I could read better. I have placed them in my backpack at my feet, far from arm's reach. My tear-crusted, red-rimmed eyes were exposed. What's up? She asked tentatively. I held up my book, tapping the title with my finger while hiding my eyes, hoping she would take a hint. Instead, she pressed against the edge of my desk. She wore our team sweats and the excess cotton fabric spilled over the pressure of her body leaning on the wooden surface. She pushed the top edge of the book down, revealing my face. I dropped it back onto the desk in defeat. You're still crying, she asked. How'd you guess I was in the library, I asked by way of response. Of course you're here. You love books, right? And we're allowed to eat lunch here, she said. I ignored her. And that is uh, just one part of the book that focuses on libraries. I love that. I feel like it's very painfully relatable. I've cried in libraries many times. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us have. Yes, and many times. I just, I love Ren as a character because she is, in my opinion, like relatable, but also not relatable at all. And I just, I love how dynamic this book is and unique. And I just wanted to ask, like, how did the story come to you? Yeah, um, so I wanted to be a painter, actually, before I realized I could be a writer. And my day job is as an art director. So I think quite visually, um, story ideas come to me first in images rather than in sentences, sort of like a vision. Um, and I don't want to reveal any spoilers, but uh, the climax of the story, when Ren fully transforms into her mermaid being, came to me in these visions and dreams and just this like very visceral image of it, it just kept popping into my head and I couldn't let it go. Um, and they wouldn't stop until I figured out how and why she got there and where she was going from there. I, I love that you talked about being a visual person. I think I definitely am too. Um, and 
I, I saw that you have an Instagram for chlorine. That's like the most visual platform you could have. Um, can you talk more about that? Of course. Um, so it was actually for me to collect inspiration and trace artistic lineage through mood boarding. Um, so iconic feminist and queer coming of age body horror from Ginger Snaps to Raw to Jennifer's Body, all amazing films. Um, they all share this sort of certain atmosphere and flavor, um, along with artists like Diane Arbus and Mira Lee, uh, who defiantly revel in the freedom of the grotesque. And I wanted to remember what these art pieces look like and feel like while I was drafting Chlorine. Um, so these film screen caps and art exhibit pictures all show up on Chlorine's Instagram account, which is at Chlorine Novel, uh, because Chlorine is just joining them in that shared artistic tradition, um, because no art piece or artist works alone, even if they try to pretend they do. There's always traditions and lineages and inspiration to pull from and be inspired by. And I wanted to highlight and celebrate and share them through the Instagram. So this came to you in visions and you have this mood board, but what was your writing process like? Yeah, a lot of crying. Um, no, just kidding. <laughs> um, I do like to read voraciously. Um, shout out to my Brooklyn library uh, for research and inspiration. Um, but in general, I think the writing process is just a lot of discipline. Um, I think there's an expectation of magic during the writing process but in a way it just feels like being an athlete to me uh, my competitive swimming background i always felt helps me as a writer a lot because you get used to rejection you get used to failure but you also get used to getting back up and sitting down and doing the work um it's just i feel like the writing process is just a lot of sitting down at your desk and getting the sentences down revising and rereading um, the same way I used to swim laps over and over again in the pool for that one successful athletic performance or that one successful finished uh, paragraph or manuscript. Do you feel like your characters change drastically throughout writing or do you think they stayed the same somewhat um, from their conception? I think that what is very fun about writing is the revision because I think in the beginning you at least I get the plot down. I figure out what I want to say and how I'm trying to say it. Um, and for me, the interiority, who the character comes to be comes through revision because while I'm drafting the first draft, I'm figuring out the plot, I'm figuring out the action. And within that, I'm trying to figure out how the character gets there. And so when I go back and read it through a vision, I'm able to figure out finally how the character feels about everything that's going on. Because while the character is experiencing it, I'm also re-experiencing it by rereading it. Um, so that allows the character to like come out fully fleshed. In my opinion, a good horror story really goes beyond the gore and the guts. And I think Chlorine is the perfect example of this. You know, you really skillfully touch on lots of topics with depth, queerness, immigration, self-harm, body image. Um, what do you hope readers get out of the story of Ren? Yeah, I hope that any reader who's ever dreamed of transcending into a truer state of being, um, truer to themselves, not true to whatever standard society has deemed for us, uh, reads Renu's story and knows that they're not alone. Um, and I hope it's for whichever reader who has ever been looked at like they're a monster um, and whichever reader is looking to reclaim that sense of being monstrous. Um, and I hope that reader knows that being a monster is far more fun than being a boring human. And again, I just, I hope that reader knows that they're not alone. I think the book's dedication um, for those who swim to stay afloat uh, says very well what I hope that readers get out of the story of Renu. So I love this debut so much that as soon as I finish it, I wanted to read more from you. Is there anything that you're working on right now? Uh, yes, I have a short story collection done that my agent is reading and some of the stories will be out in literary magazines over the next few months, which is exciting. Um, and I'm currently working on a new novel that's about uh, precarity and depression in New York City um, with friendship as a kind of love that can save us from all that despair. Because um, chlorine came from a place of anger. Um, and so I wanted to write a new novel that comes from joy and love and happiness, despite all the darkness around us, um, which is the kind of love that I give and get from my loved ones, like my friends, um, partner, etc. So. 
you just said it came from a place of anger. Did you feel like writing this was a cathartic process for you? Absolutely. I definitely think so. I mean, I think writing in general is a very cathartic process, especially for me, because I have these visions of a certain scene that I just cannot let go of until I write it down. Um, so expunging those visions, which probably do come from my subconscious somehow, um, is very cathartic no matter what I'm writing. Great. I've, I actually we get a lot of mixed answers on that. Some people are like, no, it sucked. I was miserable the whole time and I was so glad it was over. Um, so I just I really love hearing, you know, from different people. I also was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, Kathy and Run's relationship. Um, I think a lot of people who grew up queer, including myself, had a lot of, you know, female friendships in high school that are like, a little more than friendships. And again, this is one of those books I was reading and I was like, oh my God, I feel so seen <laughs> maybe the worst way. Uh, I'd love if you could talk about their relationship a little bit and, you know, your choice to include Kathy's letters. Yes, um, I am very happy you said that. I think that those uh, youthful homoerotic friendships uh, definitely defined many queers' childhoods. Um, but I... I think because Ren goes through so much um, from her time as a human, it was important for me to add a layer of tenderness and love through a friend. Um, and of course, I think part of the joy, to be honest, of being queer is that friendship becomes a very valid source of love. Um, and I know that there is pain between Kathy and Ren. I do think that there is a lot of love between them that might get twisted, but it is love in a way. And I do think friendship is a sort of love that tends to get overlooked in uh, contemporary, contemporary discourse. So I think that the love letters that are throughout the novel was to both soften the pain that's throughout it and to show that despite everything that we go through, there are people who love us and who we love that can be there for us so thank you i i just that was genuinely one of my favorite parts of the story and like it's not a romance novel obviously but it also has that like aspect to it that isn't overpowering and it didn't feel like you just threw something in there it felt so intentional and i think it really gave a lot of depth to ren and to kathy of course too um yeah, and I do think, I mean, I know it's not a traditional romance novel, but I do think that with Ren, there's a lot of romancing of the self. There's a lot of romancing of the monstrous. There's a lot of romancing of who somebody can become. And I think that kind of romance and love can be just, just as important as romance of somebody else in a way. I just, I think your writing is extremely powerful and I just cannot like, Sing your praises enough. This is just such a wonderful book, and I I just am so excited that the world gets to read this. Oh, Grace, thank you so much. This was a really lovely <laughs> conversation. So thank you. It was very truly lovely. So yes, many good feelings from everything we've talked about and what you just said. So thank you. Aww. Well, thank you for joining me today and for coming on the podcast, and thank you to librarians for listening. Chlorine is on sale uh, March twenty eighth. And I really look forward to the world reading this book. And thank you, Jade, for joining me. Thank you, Grace. That was a great interview. Grace was talking about that book for as soon as she finished. As soon as she started it, Grace was in love with that book. And you can really tell by that interview. And then the last thing we have here, certainly not least, is... Um, HarperCollins' own Deb Murphy. She is the national accounts rep who sells to library wholesalers. And she's been to the American Library Association. She used to work on the children's side. Now she's on the adult side. And so we asked Deb to come on and talk a little bit about what she does, how she does it, and what books she's really jazzed about. She's a fabulous book talker. And I can sit and listen to her for forever. She's wonderful. So now you can listen to her too. Deb Murphy. Deb Murphy, how are you? I'm doing really well, Virginia. How are you doing? I'm fine. Lainey, it's, Lainey and I are so psyched to talk to you a little bit about what you do at Harper and what books you're loving at Harper. So, Deb, let me do a little intro of you so any everybody who's listening can find out what your jam is. 
So you started at Harper in 1998. That's a long time ago. You've worn many hats. Long, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> My God, so much has changed. Um, yeah. So you've worn a lot of different hats at Harper. You started in children's books at the Harper Collins Children's Division as in sales. Mm -hmm. And then you went and became a, a field rep for kids' books. Yes. What was that like? Where were you? I was in California. I lived in sunny Pasadena and worked with mostly children's only bookstores or general bookstores with really strong children's departments kind of up the West Coast okay. to like the Bay. Well, not all the way up, but to the Bay Area and yeah. between the okay. Bay Area and San Diego, really. Oh my God, that's quite the stress. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so... That had to be super cool. Now you're back in New York. You've been back in New York for a bit. And then you've put on, as last year in 2022, you put on a new hat, uh, aware of many hats, um, <laughs> because now you're working with adult books and you're the national accounts manager for library wholesalers for the adult division. So, yes. whoa, that's a big switch. <laughs> I know it was a really big switch. And I, I have to say one of the things about it that was the strangest was that it, I did that. I made that transition during the pandemic. So I didn't really get to say goodbye to folks on the children's side, including a lot of authors and illustrators who I'm very fond of and grew very close to over all these years. And now I'm, on the adult side and slowly becoming acclimated and bit by bit meeting more and more people that I work with in the adult division, editors, marketing people, and slowly authors too. It's so slow when you don't see each other in person the way we yeah. used to. So Yeah. Well, Lainey and I are lucky because your your desk is not far from ours on the same floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's on purpose. <laughs> yes, and we're glad we're glad of that. I, um, I wanted to be around positive energy. Oh. <laughs> so before we find out about uh your reading phase and books that you're jazzed about, why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about what you do, some broad strokes on what does um a national accounts manager for library wholesalers do? Like how do you how do you uh give us a time frame of it's I find it very interesting. So and I'm sure others will too. So we really go out, um, literally or figuratively go out to sell to these really important accounts about five months before the on sale date of the books. We'll go in and visit and chat and sell a month's worth of new titles in an appointment. And that is not only a chance to talk about the books that we've read that we've really strongly pinpointed as potential blockbusters, but also finding out a little bit more information from the buyers about what librarians are looking to find and what the trends are um, kind of in the library marketplace, so to speak, and, and um, how we can learn to be better publishers for that really, really, really important outlet for our books. And then we also take time during appointments to talk about marketing opportunities that we have with the wholesalers. Most of that these days is online, but anytime that you see something on the website or get an email from your favorite wholesaler, um, those are generally the result of work between the rep and the account to um, highlight some of the best books and biggest books and biggest potential hits. So we um, hope we're putting forth a broad list for all interests and all um, genres and um, then sprinkling it with a little bit of what we feel is our own input about what we like and what we mm -hmm. think is terrific. That's it. <laughs> that was good, Deb. I think it's interesting how far in advance well, librarians by far in advance, you know, so it's all, it all marries together, but it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. And I think other people find it interesting, you know, just to see 
um, how closely you work with the library marketers and to find out what's going on. And also over and over again, you know, we're charged all of us with getting the word out there about, about all of our books, but it's, it's those, um, not even mid list really, but sort of those quieter books that, that are so exciting when we, you know, when we find those and we fall in love with them and then you have that conversation and that energy begets energy. And the next thing you know, that book is off and running. That's super cool. Right. So many of you who are listening, I hope had, uh, if you were at ALA last year in June in DC, Deb helped us out tremendously by participating in our title presentation. You know, we had that breakfast in at ALA every year and uh, Lainey was homesick, but that didn't stop Lainey from working. She was up at the crack of dawn from home working remotely to make sure that that puppy got off the, uh, off the ground and into the airwaves. <laughs> and Deb was there at the crack of dawn with me in DC, um, you know, handing out totes and catalogs and all this other stuff and then getting up there and wow in the crowd with your wonderful book talking and so I just want to give you a shout out one more time well to both of you because you were both such troopers with that and um and to that end Deb can you share some of the books that you're loving that are coming out this year you fabulous book talker you you bet someone who's become very well known to me our sort of in-house expert on true crime sarah weinman sarah is the true crime column editor for the new york times book review she's also the author of scoundrel and the real lolita um a collection of pieces on true crime was published in the last couple of years um and put together by Sarah called Unspeakable Acts. Um, and that did incredibly well. Um, really great seeding of the market for this follow-up edition. Um, the introduction for this one is written by none other than Rabia Chaudhry. Um, anyone who's anyone, who's anyone who knows anyone or anything about true crime knows that Rabia is such a blessing um, to that community. And she is the attorney and um, journalist, really, who first publicly discussed Anand Syed's case, um, which was featured in the Serial podcast. So she's written a beautiful introduction to this collection of essays. They're really designed to be sort of new classics in the true crime genre. Um, and two of my favorites and I use the word favorites sort of differently, I was most drawn to two of the stories in this book. The first one was about the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, I felt that they really, the author really captured very tumultuous cultural dynamics of a, an increasingly diverse Atlanta um, during the last few years. And I have family down there. So I'm always very interested in getting um, more insight into Atlanta's history and, and changing culture. And I also was really taken with Amanda Knox's personal essay. I thought it was very gripping. I think um, if you did any reading during the pandemic of true crime, essays or articles, you may have run across some that are in this book. I know that I had already read the Amanda Knox essay, but it just really struck me differently when I read it in this book. Um, I think it's really wonderful. And the best thing I can say, too, about what we're doing for this book is that we had such a great run with Unspeakable Acts in trade paperback that we've decided to bring this out in simultaneous trade paperback and a library hardcover edition which we know everyone will appreciate in library land. Um, so you have a choice of which format you'd like. And um, of course, I would love for everyone to dig into the hardcover, the library hardcover created especially for the library market. Um, but I did want to let you know in advance that this would be coming in two different formats, which is very exciting. Awesome. Lainey is a major 
major Sarah Weinman fan. I mean, we're all fans. <laughs> Lainey put this one on the radar for all. Excellent. Yeah, there's really no limit to what I could say of, of her work. I'm such a fan. I think she does things very, she's very conscious of the true crime revolution happening and doing it in a respectful way. And mm-hmm. she's just mm-hmm. so smart and knows so many things about it. I don't know how she keeps it all in there, but um, it's fascinating. And I'm very excited about this one. Awesome. What else you got? The next book is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. She has published several fantasy books, and this is a totally fresh genre for her. Um, It's a very realistic story about what could be the ultimate fictionalized book publishing scandal. So to work in book publishing or even to be connected to it, through selling or circulating books on this topic. It's just the possibilities are endless for you guys to connect this book with the right reader. Um, June Hayward and Athena Liu are the main characters of this book. They were young. They started out as young writing friends, um, but Athena sort of had a more direct shot like to the top of the bestseller lists. And unfortunately, and I'm really not giving anything away, she dies in an accident. And June steals her unfinished book manuscript and sets to work on polishing it up and then passing it off as her very own. And what this does is it sets off a terrible dominoes dominoes effect chain of events um as she tries to put as june tries to pull off this enormous scam um there are many characters in the book who come come into the story and they try they're very skeptical of june's authenticity and they try to expose her and meanwhile there's a layer to the story which slices today's book publishing culture wide open and it really exposes a lot of the actually existing fractures of racism um entitlement and cultural appropriation which pervade this industry um to quote the arc jacket because i could never say it any better myself um yellow face grapples with the commodification of marginalization and the terrifying alienation of social media. <laughs> yeah, that's you will not thing. be able to put this down. Yeah, that's um, a book you can't put down once you start. Right. And you don't have to be a publishing person to love it. And I think if no. you're not a publishing person, you will find it even more fascinating. But she's very on point with, you know, just like, the lingo and the, uh, you know, when, um, you know, agents go out with a project. And I mean, she's so well-versed in this and it's it's kind of cool. She's very on point. Yes. Okay. Another one of my nonfiction picks. This is Womb by Leah Hazard. Leah Hazard has a great writing background, and a great science background. She is a certified midwife practicing at the moment in Scotland. And this is Leah sharing the history of the uterus's place in science and culture. And this book answers questions that we didn't even know we had. At the same time, it lays the groundwork for imagining the future For this fascinating organ and the folks who have one at some point. Also good for the folks who don't have one. Could learn. Yes. Mm. Learning potential for everybody. Great chance to imagine a future where this particular organ is maybe not politicized. Maybe someday. What else? 
Next, I have a novelist that I just can't get enough of. Um, Christopher Bolin. Mm. The Lost Americans. Um, he totally won me over with his previous book, which was A Beautiful Crime, which takes place in Venice, Italy. This book is set primarily in Cairo, Egypt. And it's the story of a young woman named Kate. And she is the sister of a man, Eric. Both are American. And Eric is working for a defense contractor, an American defense contractor, who's on assignment in Cairo. And his body is discovered on the ground of his hotel out underneath where his room is in the hotel um and officials claim that it was a suicide um kate knows and loves her brother and knows that that is not what happened so she's determined to solve his murder and she runs into a ton of crazy roadblocks along the way um traveling between new york city and cairo and then part of the story takes place briefly in the berkshires where her parent where her mother and her stepfather live um it seems like everyone is corrupt in this book except for kate (laughs) she but she does have some some good willed um helpers along the way including this really sweet man omar and he's very helpful to Kate as he, at, on on his side, is trying really hard to get out of Egypt. Um, it's an extremely restrictive country for anyone in the LGBTQ community. And um, so he works with her uh, with solving this mystery as their goal together. And as with A Beautiful Crime... Um, Christopher Bolin sets a beautiful exotic stage for this story with his wonderful writing. Um, I'm getting more and more into literary thrillers. Thanks to Christopher Bolin. A winner. Love that. That's a great, that's a great buzz on that book. He's a great writer. He is. Next up I have Carmen and Grace Yay. <laughs> from Melissa Kosakino. Um, this is fantastic and fabulous and I'm transfixed. I actually haven't finished it yet, but I am, I'm just loving it as a wild, wild ride. Um, this is a New York based epic tale about two cousins, Carmen and Grace, and they have come of age into a huge drug dealing operation run by a woman named Donia Durka. And Donia Durka dies early in this story. And so what we see when the story opens is how her network of family members, chosen family members, some real, some chosen family, um, basically this network that works for her, they're all scrambling for hierarchy and they're all scrambling to expand on her business, to expand her business. Donia Durka passing away kind of is the trigger for Carmen starting to think that she really wants to get out of a life of crime. She's secretly pregnant and kind of moving along in that, on that calendar toward being at the point where she's going to start to show and she is trying very hard and on an accelerated schedule to try to figure out what she's going to do before everyone realizes that she's going to have a baby. She really just wants to leave the life of crime and give birth to her baby in peace. Um, Does she get there? That is the question. This is a study of how far some women will go to overturn childhoods of mistrust and even violence. There's 
no holds barred in this. Um, the language, the the um, violence, the emotional uh, game playing, it's all very, very raw and very real. Um, it's also prose about what it takes to attain power and at what cost. I think specifically for women, and I am loving the New York City setting. Um, I also really love the beautifully drawn characters, as well as the way in which Carmen just summons so much of my empathy, and probably yours as well when you read it. She's a wonderful character. Wow. Well, Deb, that was great. Do you have anything else in your in your pocket or in your sleeve? There is a book that went on sale about a month ago, Peggy Ornstein's Unraveled, and it is making quite a splash, um, getting a lot of great interviews, a lot of really key media. Um, there's a lot of video content where you can watch Peggy talk about the book, and she's just golden. Um, it's a very unusual story, but there are lots, I've come to realize that there are a lot of librarians who either knit or they engage in similar fiber crafts. Um, Peggy's research into the background, the history, and the function of these activities is really, really, really validating. If you're ever feeling guilty because you're knitting instead of reading, read this book. <laughs> It'll make you feel better about your accomplishments. Peggy will win you over um, in her efforts to understand the process of creating a sweater from scratch. Absolute scratch, starting with the shearing of the sheep, which is hilarious and dangerous, harrowing, and a little bit nail-biting. <laughs> um, it was very validating to read about Peggy's pandemic-era journey, and there's something for me, very productive and soothing to, well, not just to read this, but to experience this process that Peggy undertook during a time that was filled with such insecurity and loss. Um, it does not dwell on pandemic times. So do not be scared of that. It is simply the timing framework within which the story takes place. Um, I wish that I could have attended one of her book signing events and see the famous sweater in person, but I have not <laughs> been able to pull that off. I've seen, I've seen it on video and that reminds me, I have something I want to show you. I was going to ask what you've made that you like your favorite thing you've made. So I really hope that this is. That. I too knit something during the pandemic, uh -oh. Oh, but I did not you're love this. I did not shear the sheep. Good. And I did not spin the wool and I did not dye it. I bought it from a store, but I finished oh, the sweater. Get out of here. Um, oh my God, Deb. That's wait, beautiful. Deb, you have to hold it up and me and Virginia have to say like, and then we can take a screenshot and share it. That How long did it now, take to make that? Oh God. I started it in February of 2019. You know, you just, you get so many, listeners will totally relate to this. When you knit, there's just, you're doing like one project and then another project and you never, you have so many going on at once that you never really focus and finish one in a timely fashion. They're just always dragged on and on and on forever and ever. And of course, if I had finished it that winter, I would have worn it a lot because that was a very cold winter. However, this winter, I have worn this weather appropriate one time one time because yeah. it just hasn't been cold enough oh come on i wouldn't i wouldn't care if i died a heat stroke and wear that <laughs> all day if i wore that every day if I, if I made that thing and you need to put a tag in there that says web by deb <laughs> it's beautiful congratulations thank you absolutely gorgeous Thank you so much. Deb, thank you so much for joining us today and for spending time and, and talking about 
your life at Harper, what you do there and your love for libraries and how you connect with the wholesalers to make sure that we're on point with what we're making sure librarians know about and then sharing your thoughts on these books. You're such a wonderful book talker. It's, it's just from the heart and how these books resonate with you personally. It's just lovely. And you are you. a joy and we love, love, love working with you and sitting next to you on the 22nd floor at 195 Broadway in yes. Manhattan. Yes. You're lovely. Thank you. Can librarians please respond to this episode and show us what they've knitted? I would love that. And we will share with Deb. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Lainey. This was fun. And if you want to see that picture of Deb's sweater, we're going to put it on social. So be sure to go check it out. Oh, my God. That that sweater is beautiful. We got to get her a little tag that says, you know, webbed by Deb. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think she could use that for multiple things. You know, she <laughs> oh God, weaves the tail. Oh, my God, Lainey, you're genius. Yes, that's totally true. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm going to make them. Let's make them together. I love it. <laughs> oh, oh, I love it. Well, before well, we go, because we've had a lot of fun this episode, but we asked, we solicited <laughs> our listeners and our librarians to tell us about, this is Virginia's question, such a fantastic question. What is the wackiest or wildest thing that's ever happened in the library? And you can you still have time to submit if you want to submit and you thought oh I missed it you didn't because we have a mini episode out uh, halfway through the month for library reads so if you want to call in and tell us answer that question please do 212-207-7773 but until then we do have two audios from librarians so I was working the desk in the library one evening and a lady came in and asked me if we had a Christian fiction section. So I showed her where it was and we didn't have a certain book she was looking for. So then she came back up to the desk and she asked me in all seriousness, do you have 50 shades of gray? And I just looked at her and I looked it up and put it on hold for her and she walked away. But I thought, hmm, does she know that that's a little bit wildly different than Christian fiction? So it was really, really funny. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> that's a good one that's very funny a very diverse <laughs> selection yeah. does she know what she's gonna get that's really great good one thank you for sending that in that was great <laughs> all right second hi this is jennifer winmer assistant library director at the hundred and county library in new jersey and one of the funniest things that ever happened at our library was the Saturday after Thanksgiving one year. Um, I saw two gentlemen emptying leaves from under the hood of their Jeep. And a little while later, I got a message that there were baby squirrels outside. Well, it turns out they were toddler squirrels. And when I went outside, they started climbing up my legs. So we put them in a box, uh, made them nice and warm with a sweatshirt, and called animal control, and somebody came and got them. Um, but one of those squirrels owes me a pair of pantyhose. We love you, Virginia, Lainey, and Grace. Thank you for all you do for us. And have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> a pair of pantyhose is owed. Only with Jennifer Winberry. That is hilarious. <laughs> That's a great. <laughs> I think everyone really delivered on these prompts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I love it. That's very funny. Oh, my God. Well, what happens in the library stays in the library, except when you call the Library Love Fest phone. Then we tell everybody. <laughs> Be sure well, to send it in. Like I said, halfway through the month, we have another episode, and that question still applies. Indeed. So give us a call. Tell us a wacky thing or a funny thing that happened in your library, and we'll we'll add it to our podcast and have some fun. Have a few laughs. We could all use them. That was a jam-packed episode full of, like I said, you're in for a treat. And yeah. uh, thank you for listening. And we'll see you halfway through the month for some library reads selections. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Makes it hard to type. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Library Love Fest podcast. For more information, go to librarylovefest.com. Enjoying the show? We would love to hear what you think. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Library Love Fest, on Instagram and TikTok at Harper Library. And you can always give us a call and leave us a message you might end up on the show. That number is 212-207-7773. Be sure to rate and review us and share the show with a friend. Until next time. Thank <laughs> you.